Good afternoon again. Uh, if you weren't here for some of the prior presentations, I'm Dave Mayen and I'm the Chief Security Officer at CenturyLink. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Mike Higgins. Uh, Mike is the CTO of Reset Labs, a technology research and product development firm. He combines his experience in product design and development with his research background to make sure the most cutting edge technology is available in Risa Analytics. Before starting Risa Labs, Mike worked for Maya Design. He has published papers in Pervasive Computing, Distributed Systems, Information Virtualization, and User Experience Design. He has contributed to the design and development of numerous products for Fortune 500 companies. When not helping people to make sense of big data, Mike spends time with his wife, his cats, and his camera. Please welcome Mike Higgins. Thank you, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Feels like I'm on the microphone. So um, I'm Mike Higgins. I'm the CTO of Ryza. What we do is we help our customers uh, communicate with data. Uh, we work with a lot of media companies, a lot of big brands, help them reach their customers and tell stories with data. So that's kind of what I want to talk about today. There's parts of the problem that are about aggregation, parts of the problem that are about querying and exploration and storing data. We've heard a lot about that today. I'm going to focus on the communication piece of it, right? How you get that last mile to your customer. So, you know, why do we love big data, right? Why do we love data at all? It's because it helps us make decisions, better decisions, right? That's the point. Otherwise, you know, it's just a lot of words, a lot of numbers. Um, but if you're in sales or marketing or really any form of business, you're usually interested in helping your customer reach a particular decision, right? You want to influence them in some way uh, so that they'll come to a good decision that works well for them and works well for you, right? You'll make some money, right? So that's, that's the name of the game. You want to get them to, uh, to make a particular choice. So uh, data, though, by itself, no matter how big it is or how much you might have of it, it is not enough to do that, right? It's just one piece of the puzzle. Uh, why? Because, you know, data can be really overwhelming. Look at this poor person. Uh, she's overwhelmed just by her stacks of books and CD-ROMs. Um, imagine if she had to manage a Hadoop cluster. Probably wouldn't be pretty. Uh, data also on its own can be very sterile. You know, it's, it, it, is, it is bits in a disk drive. You know, it's not, it doesn't have a human element to it. So storytelling can be an antidote to both these problems, right? Storytelling, we've done that as human beings since we were all huddled around a fire outside the cave, you know, wondering where we were going to get the next mastodon, right? So we've been doing it for a long time. Uh, but stories by themselves, that's just stories, right? That's just science fiction, you know? And that's not what we're interested in either. So you need to kind of bring them together. You need to have the milk and the cookies. Uh, if, if you're uh, a, a normal person, then maybe the cookie is the story and the milk is the data. If you're a nerd like me, it might be the other way around because, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a little, it all depends on where your comfort factor is. So, why does that work, though? Why does it work to mix data with storytelling? How does that actually uh, make things happen? Well, one key piece of it is it lets you tell your customers something that they don't already know, right? You can come into the engagement, you can come into the discussion with something new that enlightens them. And that can be a very powerful hook. So we'll return to that idea a couple more times today. Uh, Another thing it can really do for you is build trust in the relationship you have with your customer. Uh, you become more of a partner, right? You are not just pitching them. You're not just slapping them on the back and playing golf, right? You are, you are bringing them something of value. You're bringing them information and knowledge, right? And as that pans out and they see that this is really working, right, that, that earns you a lot of trust and you can build on that. So how do you do it? Um, it is slightly more complicated than tying your shoes. Uh, there, it's, there are some tricks. Um, 
So one thing you want to do is uh, think about your story structure, right? Uh, I, I've, I've picked this slide because if you, uh, if you look at the history of stories, um, you've heard of Joseph Campbell. Uh, he's famously analyzed many myths and stories going back to the dawn of human history. And there are certain patterns that occur over and over again. The hero's journey. You see them in everything from, you know, the ancient Spartans to Rambo there, right? It's the same story template, you know, but with different details mixed into it, right? So you want to think about that as you're sort of crafting your data-driven story. Is there an archetype? Is there a template you can fit it into and then sort of work the details? Um, we're not going to use the hero's journey exactly as our data-driven story, but let's, uh, let's think about an example. This is going to be abbreviated because, you know, uh, it's a short talk, right? But I'm going to take sort of a a template here, and the template goes like this. I'm going to try to show you that I understand you and your needs. I'm going to show you that I'm bringing something special to the table, and then we're going to talk about, you know, what kind of return would we get if we work together, right? What would that look like? Um, and I'm going to make it a little more concrete. Let's talk about automotive ad sales. So this is something that some of our customers do with our platform right now. Uh, so I can, I can draw some specifics, and we'll get into some, uh, some real data. Uh, so uh, this is a real guy. This is your customer. Imagine I'm, I'm the sales guy. I want this fine fellow who sells cars to buy some advertising on my platform. Let's say it's television, right? Cable TV is going to be my advertising platform of choice. And this guy, his problem is he needs to sell cars, right? So he's got to get out there and, uh, and make some sales. So what are we going to do? Well, I want to show up and bring him something he doesn't know right, and show him that I understand him. So what I've done is I've gone in and created a simple little infographic and shown him where he sits in his market, right? Uh, the blue fraction of the bars are his sales for different models of the make of car he specializes in, Chevy, right? The gold part of the bars, that's the rest of his market. That's everybody else in his neighborhood who's also selling Chevys, right? Uh, you can look at that as uh, the competition down the street. You can look at uh, that as the opportunity for him. The, the, those are the sales in the market that he's not capturing, right? Maybe he could be if he did something differently. So what am I bringing, right? Well, this is where I get to talk a little bit about my platform, right? So if I'm going to be selling, let's, if it's cable TV, and this will depend on what you, on what you do, in fact, bring, uh, I can sell geotargeting. I can say, look, you know, instead of buying on broadcast TV where you're going to hit the entire giant Philadelphia market, I'm going to use data. I'm going to analyze where your customers actually are. That dark black line, that's where your customers really live. That's who really buys cars from you. Why don't we target our ads just to there? You know, save you some money, make it worth your while. I can do more targeting. I can say, OK, great. You want to buy some ads. Where do you place them, right? Here are some different networks. I can tell you which networks are the top for viewers in your market who currently own a Chevrolet and who plan to buy one next year. And again, this all depends on what data you have access to, but that's what big data brings you. It brings you the opportunity to find stories like this and then deliver them, right, that maybe we didn't have this ability in the past. Now, let's talk about what's going to happen over time as we work together. This is a little competition chart. In sales, uh, showing your customer their competition is uh, often very effective, right? Because uh, especially car sales guys, they're super competitive. Uh, they want to beat the guy down the street, right? So this is showing the guy uh, his share of his backyard, right? And uh, he's not the top dealer. And in fact, his share is going down a little bit. So this is maybe cause for concern, right? So. If I'm going to pitch him on advertising, what I want to tell him is let's turn that around, right? Let's make that point in the other direction. What do we have to do to do that, right? So you do a little hypothesis planning, a little scenario planning. Let's extend it into the future, okay? If these trend lines continued, it looked like that. It's not getting better. It's getting worse, right? That's, that's no good. But what do you have to do to change that? If this guy just picked up another 65 registrations next year, he changed the slope of that line. And if you remember, click back a couple slides. Whoops. There's a lot of registrations in those gold bars. He doesn't have to get all of them. He just has to get some of them, right? Not even a very big amount. So that gives us a, you know, a really nice plan that we can work on together. And we can see how it performs. So, 
that was really specific, right? That was sort of cable TV ad sales to a car salesman, right? I am venture to guess, uh, I don't have the data, but probably none of you in this room are actually selling cable TV ad sales to car salesmen. Um, so how do you guys make use of this in whatever businesses you're in? Well, there are some general tips and tricks, so I'll try to go through this quickly. Uh, when you're presenting data-driven stories, keep it simple. One of the problems with big data is it's really complicated. There's a lot of it. You're going to be tempted and pulled to overcomplicate the story. Don't. Keep it simple. Keep the points simple, right? Uh, we said this already. Tell them something they don't know. Surprise them. Hook them. Give them something that they haven't heard before. Our car sales guy, he knows his own sales figures, right? That's not new. You're not telling him anything. He probably already knows he's got share trouble, right? But you can show him the sales of the other people in the market. That's something he doesn't know. You can show him where his customers actually live. He might not know that either, right? So that's interesting information. Uh, visualize the data. Don't just throw big charts of Excel tables at him. You know, turn it into pictures, turn it into graphics, turn it into something humanized, something visual that they can latch onto and grasp in an instant. Always provide attribution for your data. I went through it pretty quick. You might not have noticed it. Down at the bottom of those data slides earlier, there was the attribution for where that source data actually comes from. It's real data that comes out of our tool. Um, I actually did anonymize it slightly, uh, so you couldn't tell what dealer was what, but the numbers are correct. So you always want to do this uh, because it gives you credibility. Uh, you can speak to the methodology of the data provider. It gives you an argument from authority if you're able to use an industry standard like a Nielsen or a Polk Automotive or something like that, right? Um, and, you know, it's good practice. You just should do it. Uh, I mentioned this earlier. Don't, don't just try to slam them with tons and tons and tons of numbers. You know, people's eyes will glaze over. They'll think you're bamboozling them. It's not, not, a, not a great look. Uh, don't do this. <laughs> so uh, there's, a great, uh, there's a great Tumblr out there called uh, WTF Visualizations, and you can subscribe to it and get a different bad information visualization every day of the week. Uh, this is one I've picked more or less at random. Uh, there are many sins being committed in this visualization. Uh, it's trying to show too much at once. The axes are unclear and unlabeled. It's using 3D for no good reason. It's hard to compare these actual trend lines. There's a lot going on. Uh, don't ever lie with your data. Remember what we were trying to do? We were trying to establish trust. You want to sell to this guy again next month and the month after that and the year after that, right? You know, you, you can't do that and your mom would not be pleased with you either. Uh, it's easy to make visualization mistakes. You need to have some skill with this and some craft. Um, let's be generous and say that this was an error and not a deliberate misrepresentation. Uh, the, the problem with this bar chart, uh, if you're not familiar with how information graphics work, uh, they started the chart, the axis starts at 34, right? So what happens is that bar on the right looks like it's about five times as tall as the bar on the left. It is not. It, that is not the magnitude of change that's going on there. Uh, so uh, that's either an error or a deliberate misrepresentation of the data. Uh, so we'll be generous in this case. Uh, I want to say briefly, when you're thinking about information visualization, there's a difference between explanatory visualization and explorative visualization. What I've been talking about is explanatory. This is explorative. Uh, this is not our tool. This is uh, uh, something I just uh, found on the web. It's a system called Prisma. I think it's Portuguese. It's a research system. This is for analysis of high dimensional data. Um, each of these different visualizations encodes six or seven different dimensions of a high dimensional data space, and they're coordinated with each other. So you can actually uh, visualize different dimensions simultaneously and cross connect. These things are super powerful and they're wonderful when you're trying to find the patterns and find the sales stories. They're not so good when you're trying to explain them, especially to non-technical audiences. So just be careful. You need to be an expert to use tools like this. Uh, if you want to learn more about this, there are lots of great resources out there. So uh, uh, Tufti is, of course, the gold standard. Uh, there's another great book uh, by the Flowing Data People. Uh, there's lots more. These are just two examples. Um, and this is not just for sales. Uh, you can really use this kind of technique, this kind of communications approach, anytime you've got a gap between 
experts who know a lot about data and information, and deciders, people who need to actually make a decision and take action. Whenever that gap exists, there's an opportunity for data-driven storytelling, and there's an opportunity for this role in the middle, this person who bridges that gap. Uh, in our case, you know, it might be a salesperson, but it also works, uh, you know, we did, we've done a lot of work with uh, environmental science, uh, who, and in that case, it's lobbyists uh, and activists. They might be trying to influence politicians or concerned citizens, and over on the expert side of things, it would be uh, environmental scientists. Whereas in a business context, maybe those folks are business analysts or researchers. So does it work? Um, I was going to quote some statistics and, uh, and uh, customer feedback from you, but fortunately this morning, as it turns out, there was an entire panel session where one of our customers uh, gave a really great case study of a bunch of data-driven story techniques, Rachel Ticola over at Gamut. And I think I won't gild the lily any because I think that was a pretty effective presentation on its own. Uh, our customers really see a lot of uh, benefit from this approach. And what we found happen is uh, when traditional salespeople start taking a data-driven approach, they get addicted to it, right? You know, they start using those data-driven graphics, they start using that information, and then they don't want to go out into the field without it, right? That really becomes a powerful weapon for them to use. Uh, so we've been pretty pleased with its effectiveness so far. So finally, you know, don't just play games with numbers, right? You've got... We have the data, we have the technology to make sense of the data, we have to communicate the data and get it to people who can make decisions and take action. And that involves a little bit of artistry and a little bit of you know, human connection and storytelling and skill. Um, there are tools that can help you, right? I went through and did all those do's and don'ts and alluded to books and you need to be trained and all that stuff. Guess what? You can also buy tools that do it. We happen to sell one, so you know, it's an option for you out there. Uh, I think that's about all I have for you here. I'm told that we're gonna do the question and answer stuff kind of outside uh, so that we can keep the track moving along in here. Uh, so that's what I'm gonna do is I'll be available uh, if folks wanna talk further.